So last time I talked a little bit about the book in general and how it came to be and what's in it. And I thought this time I would read a little bit from it. So uh, this is chapter 12 called The Mind and Its Potential. <clears throat> As sentient beings with minds that are still obscured, we have great potential. Our greatest potential being to become fully awakened Buddhists, omniscient beings who have the wisdom, compassion, power, and skillful means to be of the greatest benefit to all. A natural quality of mind is its ability to cognize objects. This capacity to be aware of and to know objects is always present. It does not have to be newly cultivated, because that's the nature of the mind. Nevertheless, various obstructions can inhibit the mind from cognizing objects. When these obstructions are eliminated, the mind will have no difficulty knowing all phenomena. So I think that right away is like stupendous, you know. The nature of the mind is to uh, reflect and engage in all phenomena, and it's just obscurations that prevent it from doing that. One type of obscuration or obstruction is physical matter. A, water, a wall obstructs us from seeing what is beyond it. When the wall is removed, our visual consciousness can see what is there. A second obstruction is distance and size. The object is too far away or too small for our cognitive faculties to come in contact with it. To some extent, telescopes and microscopes has help, have helped alleviate this difficulty. In these cases, we can know the object not because the mind has become clearer and better able to apprehend the object, but because the object is brought within the range of our operable cognitive faculties. Yeah. So our cognitive faculties, our sense faculties, don't uh, you know, have the ability to see every single sight, hear every single sound, hear every you know, single smell. There have to be certain conditions present for them to do that. If something's too far away, you know, if it's too small, if the odor isn't strong enough, okay, uh, if our, um, yeah, so it could have to do with the object, it could have to do with their sense faculty having some kind of impediment. A third difficulty concerns the cognitive faculties that are the basis of consciousness. The visual consciousness is able to perceive only visual forms, not sounds or other sense phenomena, because it is dependent on the eye faculty. If a healthy eye faculty is absent, the visual consciousness cannot perceive visible forms. So each sense faculty corresponds with its own object and its own consciousness, and in sentient beings they aren't cross-functional. In a Buddha they are, but for us they're not. Yeah, and so if the faculty has some difficulty, you know, then you're short-sighted, you have cataracts, you uh, can't hear, and eh, eh, you see I have my hearing aids in today, um, you know, then uh, you have problems. <laughs> the type of brain a being has also influences what that being can perceive. A mental faculty dependent on an animal brain and one dependent on a human brain have different ranges of objects they can know. Due to the complexity of the brains of these two beings, the mental faculties and consciousnesses depending on them differ in what they can perceive and understand and how they perceive and understand something because something that uh, you know looks quite foul to us, to a fly looks delicious, and uh, you know what the cats eat looks quite repugnant to us. So uh, you know it has to do with the with the karma that conditions uh, the faculties and the consciousness too. Furthermore, a mind proliferating with wrong views and overwhelmed with disturbing emotions is too distracted and preoccupied to turn its attention to other objects. The range of what such afflictive mental states can know becomes very limited. 
a, a calm mind can be more astute. In your own experience, true or not true? When you're upset, you know, I mean, we can barely see the physical things around us, let alone, you know, think about any, think about the Dharma, think about anything worthwhile. Our minds are just, you know, rolling around in our affliction. A further difficulty in knowing objects is that some objects are so subtle, profound, or vast that the ordinary mind is unable to cognize them. To know these objects, single-pointed concentration and or wisdom that is free from wrong conceptions is needed. Okay, so to perceive emptiness, this, you know, we need these special consciousnesses. To know subtle impermanence also, you know, our regular ordinary consciousnesses don't have the ability um, to perceive these subtle objects. Another type of obstruction is subtle defilements on the mind that produce false appearances. These prevent us from attaining Buddhahood, the state of omniscient mind. When these subtle defilements are removed, the mind will naturally perceive all phenomena. The main obstructions to omniscience are the latencies of afflictions, the subtle appearance of inherent existence that they produce, and the defilement preventing seeing the two truths simultaneously. After the wisdom realizing ultimate reality eliminates the afflictive obscurations, it must cleanse the cognitive obscurations from the mind. When every last defilement is removed, the mind is totally purified and its excellent qualities are fully developed. This is the state of Buddhahood in which the capabilities of the mind have no limits. The effectiveness of a Buddha's activities depend not on the abilities of that Buddha, but on the receptivity of sentient beings. Yeah. So when we become a Buddha, from our side, no obscurations to, uh, to viewing everything. So in terms of helping sentient beings, that's very helpful because then you can see people's karma, their tendencies, their inclinations, and uh, you know what paths are suitable, and so you can teach according to all of that. Um, and so, from the side of a Buddha, there's there's no hindrance. You know, Buddhas don't get exhausted, and they don't get fed up, and um, they don't get discouraged, and stuff like that. So none of those kind of obscurations either. Uh, so you know, if we wonder, oh, well, how come the Buddha's not always helping us? I think the Buddhas are trying, but we aren't very receptive sometimes. You know, like when our mind is twirling around in afflictions, you know, the, the Buddha may be trying to communicate, and we're out to lunch, totally out to lunch. So this is, you know, why you're doing the Vajrasattva retreat right now, to purify a lot of those kind of obscurations. And also, you know, why we meditate on Lam Rim and thought training to reduce the, the power of the afflictions so that they don't take over the mind so much and so that we can be more receptive to the Buddha's awakening activities. Okay, so from here on, it, um, it goes into is liberation possibly possible? And uh, excellent qualities can be cultivated limitlessly and more about the nature of the mind and uh, then really going into Buddha nature and what it is and how it works.